Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to be here, and I'm particularly delighted to be here on this occasion. The greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. Despite the striking fact that most of the scientists that the world has ever known are alive and working today, despite the fact that this nation's own scientific manpower is doubling every 12 years in a rate of growth more than three times that of our population as a whole. Despite that, the vast stretches of the unknown and the unanswered and the unfinished still far outstrip our collective comprehension. No man can fully grasp how far and how fast we have come. And now, if America's new spacecraft succeeds, we will have literally reached the stars. This is a breathtaking pace. And such a pace cannot help but create new ills as it dispels old. New ignorance, new problems, new dangers. Surely the opening vistas of space promise high costs and hardships as well as high reward. So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer, to rest, to wait. But this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them. This country was conquered by those who moved forward, and so was space. William Bradford, speaking in 1630 of the founding of the Plymouth Bay Colony, said that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulty, and both must be enterprised and overcome with answerable courage. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. And no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Those who came before us made certain that this country rode the first waves of the Industrial Revolution, the first waves of modern invention, and the first wave of nuclear power. And this generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. For the eyes of the world now look into space and to the planets beyond. And we have vowed that we shall not see it governed by a hostile flag of conquest, but by a banner of freedom and peace. We have vowed that we shall not see space filled with weapons of mass destruction, but with instruments of knowledge and understanding. Yet the vows of this nation can only be fulfilled if we in this nation are first, and therefore we intend to be first. Our leadership in science and industry our hopes for peace and security, our obligations to ourselves as well as others, all require us to make this effort, to solve them for the good of all men and to become the world's leading spacefaring nation. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. For space science, has no conscience of its own. Whether it will become a force for good or ill depends on man. And only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war. Space can be explored and mastered. There is no strife no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. And its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. Why choose this as our goal? Why climb the highest mountain? Why fly the Atlantic? Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills.
because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. It is for these reasons that I regard the decision last year to shift our efforts in space from low to high gear as among the most important decisions that will be made during my incumbency in the office of the presidency. In the last 24 hours, we have seen facilities now being created for the greatest and most complex exploration in man's history. We have felt the ground shake and the air shattered by the testing of a Saturn C-1 booster rocket, many times as powerful as the Atlas which launched John Glenn. We have seen the site where five F-1 rocket engines, each one as powerful as all eight engines of the Saturn combined, will be clustered together to make the most intricate instrument in the history of space science. The accuracy of that shot is comparable to firing a missile from Cape Canaveral and dropping it in this stadium between the 40-yard lines. Transit satellites are helping our ships at sea to steer a safer course. Tyrus satellites have given us unprecedented warnings of hurricanes and storms, and will do the same for forest fires and icebergs. We have had our failures, but so have others, even if they do not admit them, and they may be less public. Space and related industries are generating new demands in investment and skilled personnel. And this city and this state and this region will become the heart of a large scientific and engineering community during the next five years and to direct or contract for new space efforts over $1 billion from this center in this city. To be sure, all this costs us all a good deal of money. A staggering sum, though somewhat less than we pay for cigarettes and cigars every year. Even though I realize that this is, in some measure, an act of faith and vision, for we do not now know what Entry benefits burn. await us. A giant rocket, more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses, several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival, on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first, before this dictate is out, then we must be bold. I'm the one who's doing all the work, so uh, it just wants to stay cool for a minute. However, I think we're going to do it, and I think that uh, we must pay what needs to be paid. I don't think we ought to waste any money, but I think we ought to do the job. It may be done while some of you are still here at school at this college and university. But it will be done, and it will be done before the end of this decade as part of a great national effort of the United States of America. Many years ago, great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. Well, space is there, and we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there. And new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Thank you.